the presentation I want to give today is basically a truncated version of a talk that I gave at the British Society of Animal Science meetings in Westport, Ireland uh, in May. And the title of the talk is Assessment of Activity Monitors for Detection of Estrus in Lactating Dairy Cows. And so just to get started, if I can get the next slide up here. Um, these accelerometer systems um, are relatively new. Uh, there's a lot of players uh, that are out there in the marketplace now selling these systems directly to, uh, to dairy farmers. And so I'm just showing a few of those on the screen. Um, you can see over on the right-hand side, AI24. I just spent uh, the last six months in, uh, in Ireland at Moorpark. And there's an Irish company, Dairy Master, that, that has a system as well. Um, here in the U.S., Select Detect is marketing the Dairy Master system uh, under uh, the name Select Detect. That's a Select Sires uh, product. And then the system that I'm going to talk mostly about today is the SCR system, which was uh, is is an Israeli system. And so all of these systems are out in the marketplace. And uh, this area of um, accelerometers or or uh, activity monitors is what I would consider to be a, a fairly hot topic. So just to orient everybody, I'm, I'm here in Wisconsin, and so I'm kind of circling Wisconsin with my mouse. Uh, Wisconsin is a dairy state. We have about 1.3 million lactating dairy cows. Uh, and you can see the regions of the U.S. Where, where dairy is located. If I zoom in on the state of Wisconsin then, uh, you can see these areas that are, that are shown in green. The density of the green or the darkness of the green is the density of dairy cows. So we've got a lot of uh, cows in Wisconsin. You can see that there's this kind of donut shape. Um, the center part of Wisconsin is filled with sandy soil, so there's a lot of crops grown there, not a lot of dairies. Um, so one of the things that I did just to kind of just to kind of visually show people how popular these systems are, um, the folks at SCR were nice enough to to send me this particular slide. And the slide is not meant so that you can count the dots, but each one of those uh, teardrop shaped uh, signs there over Wisconsin are showing you the location of an SCR system that has recently been purchased. And so I'm sure that um, the people from Select Sires could show a very similar graph. Uh, it's a very hot topic. There's a lot of farms that are, that are buying these particular systems. And when that sort of a thing happens, as Jenny said, I have a 70% extension appointment. I start getting a lot of questions on, well, how do these systems work, and, and should I consider uh, purchasing one of those systems? And so I actually did get quite a few calls regarding this, got a lot of emails from veterinarians, a lot of questions from, from dairy farmers regarding uh, these systems. And so I decided that the best way to try to answer some of these questions is actually work with the systems and, and generate some data. Uh, this is just the older version of the SCR system. This is the actual version that we worked with. There's a newer generation uh, that has come along. But you can see this is a cow um, on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. She has a collar on her neck. And right here on the side of her neck, right over here by her ear, is the activity monitor. Uh, it has to stay on the side of that cow's neck. And so one of the advantages of these systems is that it's attached to the cow. It's assessing her activity. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so each time this cow then leaves the parlor, she walks through this archway, and there are these readers, and you can see a close-up of the reader in the lower right-hand portion of the screen, that are going to basically download the data from uh, that particular collar. Now, the big change that's been made in, in most of these systems lately is that a lot of these systems now are completely wireless, and one of the reasons for that is that they want to monitor other things such as rumination during the dry period when a cow isn't coming through the parlor. And so most of the newer units are talking directly with the computer all the time uh, to basically download the data into the system to say uh, what's going on. So again, this is older software. This was the software uh, that we were using on, on the farm. But what this shows then is the baseline activity of cow is, is set at zero. So the y-axis essentially is uh, arbitrary units and then the x-axis is time and so you can see that what these collars do the collars have to be on the cows for a certain number of days usually seven to ten days so they're going to establish the cows baseline so she's going to have baseline uh, activity she's going to be getting up and moving around within the pen she's going to be going back and forth to the parlor so on and so forth one of the things that happens at estrus is that estrogen gets high 
and the cow then increases her physical activity. She's going to do a lot more mounting. She's going to get restless. She's going to move around a lot more. And so what the system then is measuring is really a secondary sign of estrus. The primary sign of estrus is standing to be mounted by a herd mate. One of the secondary signs of estrus then is an increase in physical activity associated with estrus. So you can see this cow, she's um, at her baseline. And then you can see the red bars are the actual raw data. You can see that she increases in her activity over a period of time. Then she decreases activity and goes back to baseline. The yellow line is kind of a rolling average. And so this yellow line is actually what the system uses to trigger the breed signal to say that yes indeed this cow is in estrus and she should be inseminated. Now this presents a lot of interesting questions from just a research standpoint. As I said the primary sign of estrus is standing to be mounted by a herd mate. And so one of the first questions I had for the companies that are selling these systems is you, you know do you know when cows ovulate in relation to this increase in physical activity? And, and really the question is, do the cows ovulate very tightly in relation to this increase in activity? Or is there a lot of variation among cows? And the reason that that's an important question is because timing of insemination in relation to ovulation has a lot to do with the fertility of the resulting insemination. And so, uh, so the first question that we simply asked ourselves then was, how well does an increase in this physical activity predict the time of ovulation. Uh, this is a publication. It was published in the Journal of Dairy Science back in 2012. A couple of my graduate students here who worked on the project. It was entitled Assessment of an Accelerometer System for Detection of Asterisk. There were some, also some other things that we looked at in here that I'm not going to talk about today. And so this, uh, a lot of the research that I do here at the University of Wisconsin takes place on commercial dairy farms. This is a dairy farm in Lancaster, Wisconsin. If you look at the map over here on the right hand side, uh, the, red, the red star is on Madison. That's where I am at the University of Wisconsin. And then this blue star is Lancaster, Wisconsin. So this is about an 80 mile journey uh, between uh, the university and this particular farm. This particular farm, Majestic View Dairy, it's a family owned dairy farm, about a thousand cows. They had purchased an SCR system. So they had the system in place and we went to them and we simply asked if we could use their cows and, and try to answer some questions. They were really uh, enthusiastic about that. They were really uh, great people to, to work with. So the first experiment that we designed was to answer the question about the timing of insemination. And what we did is we took 112 cows and on this size of a farm we did this in six replicates and across time, so this was done across, uh, across a year or so. These cows were between 46 and 52 days in milk and what we did is we set them up to come into estrus and to do that we used a synchronization system. What we did is we gave a GNRH injection that would have been on a Monday. We ultrasounded the cows, we took a blood sample so we can measure progesterone. Seven days later on a Monday we gave a second, or excuse me, we gave a second injection that would have been the prostaglandin. We uh, ultrasounded the cows, took a blood sample, and we put a KMAR. Most of you probably know what these are. These are pressure-activated rump-mounted uh, estrus detection devices. So we kind of had another way to determine the accuracy of, of this particular system. So this is basically two-thirds of an off-sync protocol. What we did is we left off the last injection of GNRH. And so we were very stringent about which cows we kept in the study. They had to have a corpus luteum at this prostaglandin, and they had to have a follicle uh, greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. So we had to remove 23 cows from the data set. So we ended up with 89 cows that, in theory, should have been really well set up to come into estrus. And then what the students did is they basically lived on the farm, and three times a day after the cows were milked, so this is a 3x dairy, when the cows left um, the parlor, um, they, were, they were basically ultrasounded uh, three times a day to determine if and when they ovulated. So we knew if and when a cow ovulated, and we knew if and when a cow was detected in estrus um, based on either the KMAR or based on the accelerometer system. And basically we assessed this for an entire week. Uh, within seven days here uh, of that prostaglandin. 
So just to dive into the results, go through this rather quickly. The first column that you see here are the data from the accelerometer system or the activity monitoring system. Of the 89 cows that we had, the system detected 71% of those cows in estrus. And uh, that number was a little lower than I expected that it would be, uh, simply because we had selected the cows so stringently for cows that should have come into heat. But that's what the number was. It was 70, 71%. The good news for the accelerometer system is for the cows that are showing estrus, it detected those cows in estrus, and 95% of those cows went on to ovulate. Only 5% of them didn't ovulate. This shouldn't be. This is very typical, uh, well documented in the literature that there are some cows that will in fact show estrus and not go on to ovulate. So that's not really the problem. The problem comes with this 29% of cows that showed no estrus, and of those cows, 35% of them ovulated. So we have cows that are showing estrus but are actually ovulating. And we have some cows that, or excuse me, we have cows that are not showing estrus and ovulating. And we have cows that are not showing estrus and not ovulating. If you look at these numbers a little care more carefully, it's essentially 10% of the 89 cows were not showing estrus but were going on to ovulate. And about 20% of those cows had no estrus and no ovulation. And um, I want to show this data set. This is another data set just looking at this concept of these anovular cows or this phenomenon of these anovular cows. This is a large data set, 5,818 records from 13 studies across eight herds in, in several different states in the United States. Basically looking at vital condition score at the time of insemination. And you can see uh, the prevalence of anovulation is shown in these bars. So as body condition score goes up, the trend is that anovular cows tend to go down. But there's an awful lot of cows with reasonable body condition score. The, the, the dotted line here is the number of cows read on the right-hand uh, y-axis. You can see the majority of cows are in decent body condition score, but in fact are anovular. And the prevalence of this is about one in four cows, 23.3%. Uh, this represents a significant challenge for these activity monitoring systems because we have a substantial population of cows, about 25% of the cows in our herds, that aren't showing estrus. So there's no way that you're going to breed those cows based on an accelerometer system uh, if they're not, in fact, uh, showing estrus. Just a couple more things on this study. This is just the duration of activity. Uh, it's a nor normally distributed. I think this, this very same data has been shown with the other systems. The average for the uh, duration is about 16.1 hours. This was calculated on six, 61 cows. And then this was really the data that gets to the question that we had at hand when we started this study. What was the interval from AI to ovulation? Now on average, we want to put semen into cows somewhere between 8 and 12 hours before they ovulate. The sperm needs time to capacitate before uh, it can fertilize an oocyte. So on average, uh, the system does a nice job of getting them in that time frame. They're about just eight hours uh, before the cow ovulates is when they're putting semen into them. But the thing that was really problematic in my mind was there's a lot of variation around that. And if you look at this graph, these cows in these three bars on the left are inseminated too late. They're inseminated after the cow has ovulated. On the right, these cows in these three bar, uh, bars are inseminated way too early or before they ovulate. Both of these are going to end up with uh, lower fertility as compared to the cows uh, that we have here in the middle. And just to kind of flesh out this concept, <clears throat> this is just looking at timing of insemination after onset of estrus or after the second GNRH injection of, a, of an off-sync type synchronization program. You can see cows ovulate at 24 to 32 hours. The sweet spot is here between 8 and 16 hours. We can breed cows too early, probably a problem with low fertilization rate and higher embryo quality. We can certainly breed cows too late, where we get a high fertilization rate but a low embryo quality. And when you breed cows to estrus, uh, and this isn't just with these accelerometer systems, I think this would happen even if we're breeding cows to estrus. The thing we can do with a synchronization program, however, is we can determine exactly when we breed in relation to ovulation. So we can pretty much fit our cows into a more optimized time frame. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the second study. So after completing that first study, 
what we decided to do was to try to see how best we could fit this technology, this accelerometer technology that a lot of dairy producers are now adopting. What is the best way to fit it into a reproductive management program, knowing that we have a population of cows that, for example, aren't cycling and that you'd have no chance of, of inseminating to estrus. So we stayed working with uh, Majestic View Dairy uh, on this second uh, study. So for those of you that are uh, in England, which I, I think is most of you, uh, a very popular strategy for submitting cows to first insemination would be this particular protocol. It's called a pre-sync, off-sync protocol. Probably the most popular protocol, protocol used to submit cows for first service in North America. It involves two sequential injections of prostaglandin F2 alpha 14 days apart. And then 10 to 12 days later, these last three uh, treatments would represent then uh, the off-sync part of the program. What I want to emphasize is that you'll catch a lot of cows in estrus, and many farms are doing that. You're going to catch a lot of cows in estrus after the second prostaglandin. So I would say 50 to 60 percent of our cows are probably bred to an estrus after these two prostaglandins. The remainder of the cows will start the offsing protocol and get inseminated to time of AI. It's a very popular protocol, a very uh, good protocol. And this is just a visual depiction, a scatter plot of a farm that's using this system. On the y-axis, we've got days in milk when the cows are inseminated. Each cow is represented by a box here. On the y-axis, we've got essentially a time axis. And so you can see 50 days in milk is the voluntary waiting period for this particular farm. So they're really not breeding uh, many cows here before 50 days in milk. The cows that are represented by the purple boxes then would be the cows bred to estrus after those two prostaglandins. So the second prostaglandin would be set here at 50 days in milk. The first one would be around day 36. And then anything not bred to estrus would be enrolled into the off-sync part of the program. It takes 10 days to do that. And then somewhere between 72 and 80 days, you can see all these yellow cows are going to get submitted to, uh, to a timed artificial insemination. So it gives a dairy farmer a lot of control over submitting cows for first breeding. You can control your voluntary waiting period, and you can breed nearly all of your cows uh, at a given day in milk. For this farm, it's, it's 80 days in milk. Uh, this is what I see happening then in the industry. I get a lot of these, these uh, computer files sent to me. So here's a farm that was doing exactly what I showed you in the previous slide. And what they're doing is they're controlling their voluntary waiting period. They've set a limit on the days in milk when they're going to breed cows, and they're breeding 100% of their cows. And right at this particular point in time, they incorporated an activity monitoring system, which I think it's an interesting technology. It's a great technology. But the mistake that I see farmers making now is they want to completely eliminate any systematic breeding program. And that's exactly what this farm did. And you can see. They're breeding a lot of cows to estrus. I would say somewhere on the 60, 70 percent of the cows they can breed to an estrus. But a lot of the cows, they aren't catching an estrus, and they're not controlling the maximum days in milk that cows are getting inseminated. And the other thing that happens during this period of time is the cows that aren't cycling, those anovular cows, 20 to 30 percent of the cows in most herds, are not getting inseminated. They're not getting exposed to the risk of becoming pregnant, which is having semen put into them during this period of time. And so you can see on the right hand side of this graph what this farm did, although they bought this accelerometer system, they went back to using somewhat of a systematic system uh, for dealing with these cows that the system cannot uh, catch in heat. And so you can see those cows out here uh, again getting submitted to the offsync type program. So what we did in this particular trial is we said let's let's look at this. Treatment one, I'm not going to talk too much about the two interesting treatments in this study were treatment two, which is a pre-sync off-sync system, as I just showed you. And what they did for cows that were enrolled in this treatment was any cows that showed activity after that second prostaglandin were inseminated to that activity. And only cows not seen uh, with increased activity went into the off-sync part of the program. And then treatment three is somewhat of a control for that. And what happened in treatment three is all cows went through this protocol, regardless of whether they showed activity or not, they were not inseminated. They all got a timed insemination. And so that allowed us to look at some things regarding conception rates uh, in this particular study. 
So if you compare the three treatments, what I've shown here on this graph is in the red vertical dotted line, you can see the voluntary waiting period. And if you look at cows in treatment two, that's the dashed line, you can see that they, um, they get their second prostaglandin here at around day 50. They breed a lot of cows to estrus. That tails off, and then they get to the off sync part of the program, and those cows are inseminated. Contrast that to treatment three, where all cows are pretty much delayed for first breeding, clear out here to, to between day 72 and, and 80. And so you've got two things going on here. You're actually breeding cows earlier by breeding them to estrus after that second prostaglandin. You're breeding the cows later when you don't do estrus detection and you do 100% time by eye. And obviously the service rate will be higher for the cows that you're breeding earlier as compared to the cows that you delay, which are going to have um, a lower service rate. And so let's look a little bit more closely at what happened, which I think is quite interesting. So remember, all these cows had an activity monitor system on them. And what we found is that 69% of the cows enrolled in treatment two were detected with increased activity after that second prostaglandin. And that number is very close to what I showed you in that first study. So you know, 60, 69, 70 percent of the cows show an estrus. That would be per, pretty much following the textbook. Those cows that were bred to that activity then, that were inseminated to that activity, had a 29 percent conception rate. Now, in our cows uh, here in the U.S., um, breeding cows to estrus, 30 uh, percent is kind of what I would consider my cutoff point. So, as far as good versus kind of not acceptable conception rate. So, this is kind of sitting right uh, right there at that uh, just under 30 at 29 percent. Interestingly enough, the cows that then went through the protocol, now these are cows, keep in mind, 31 percent of the cows, these are cows that did not show increased activity, so you really have no other way to breed these cows at this particular time. They go through an off-sync protocol when you do the timed artificial insemination. They don't have bad conception rates, 35 percent. The other thing that we did in this study is we pulled blood samples at this first GNRH injection. And the reason we did that, many people would assume that if the cows weren't showing activity, most cows that don't show activity should be classic anovular cows. And an anovular cow, you would expect to have low progesterone at this time. So I would have expected a lot of these cows to have low progesterone at this first GNRH injection. In fact, 58% of the cows that were not caught with increased activity had high progesterone at this time, indicating that they were in fact cycling, indicating that some cycling cows, for whatever reason, either aren't showing enough activity uh, to be detected by the system, or they're ovulating without showing signs of activity, as I showed in that first, uh, at, in that first experiment. So we actually end up with fairly reasonable conception rates. If we put anovular cows on an off-sync protocol, I would expect conception rates somewhere in the in the mid to low 20 percent range. So really we get pretty good uh, fertility if we submit these cows that we don't see an estrus uh, into the off-sync part of the program. Now let's compare that to treatment three. Um, again, these cows went through. Now we monitored activity, but remember we didn't inseminate those cows, but just as kind of a benchmark, just like in, the, in treatment two, 70 percent of the cows showed activity during this time. Now, the interesting thing about that, remember, the conception rate, if you would have inseminated those cows was 29%. If we let them go to the time of insemination, their conception rate increased from 29% to 41%. Um, so significantly higher conception rate. Keep in mind that it's later, okay? And so in some ways, we're not comparing apples to apples. We're, we're a little confounded here with days in milk. It's not a tremendous number of days in milk. But these cows, in fact, are inseminated later. Later, But suffice it to say, uh, the conception rate is quite a bit higher. So although, although we're delaying first insemination, we're getting a higher conception rate on those cows. Cows without activity receiving time to eye, again, that was about 30% of the cows. And the conception rate for those cows was 32%. Now, again, we looked at progesterone at the first GnRH injection. Remember, all cows in, in this treatment got the first GnRH injection. If they um, if they showed activity here, I would have expected them to have high progesterone. 75% of them did. But again, the cows that did not show activity, just like before, 55% of those had high progesterone, indicating that there are some cycling cows that, in fact, are not being detected 
uh, with activity. So a couple more pieces of data and then I'll try to summarize here. Um, another interesting thing we found was there was a treatment by parity interaction. So if we look at the first lactation cows, these first lactation cows, and again treatment two, remember treatment two is a mixture between timed insemination and breeding cows based on activity. If you look at the first lactation cows versus the older cows, when you combine heat detection with only putting the cows toward a timed AI that don't show activity, there was no difference in conception rates and the conception rates were relatively low. If you put all of the cows through a timed insemination program, there was a significantly higher conception rate for the first lactation animals. The older cows, no difference in their fertility. And this is something that we're continuing to look at, and I think we pretty much know what's going on with these lactating, these older cows, and I think we can probably fix this particular problem uh, with the time insemination systems that we have. Last thing I'll leave you with is that uh, I've worked uh, very closely with a colleague of mine, Dr. Victor Cabrera. He's right across the hallway here in the department, and Victor is a modeler, and Victor can take uh, basically economic models and put some numbers to the data that I've just shown you. And so we're very interested in doing that just to get some idea of the economics that are coming from the experiment that I showed you. So the second experiment, what we did is we essentially took the data that we, that we got from that particular farm and this um, model uses data directly from the farm, so it's going to use the actual lactation curves from the farm to try to model this. When you look at the economic outcome, and this is the net present value in dollars per cow per year, you can see that essentially treatment two and treatment three were almost identical as far as their net present value in dollars per cow per year. Now what this essentially says is that Either of those strategies that I showed you in treatment two, where you combine heat detection with, uh, with timed insemination, or treatment three, where you do 100% timed insemination, result in very similar economic outcomes. In other words, you can delay first breeding if you do 100% timed AI because you get a higher conception rate to those breedings. By contrast, you breed cows in treatment two a little bit earlier to a lower conception rate, but you're driving the service rate on those particular cows, which makes up for the lower, lower conception rate. So that's just a really interesting outcome. Um, I think there's more than one way to, to approach reproduction, obviously, on farms, and I think there's a variety of strategies that we can use. Um, the biology uh, behind what's going on with some of these uh, cows is actually quite interesting as well. The last thing I'll leave you with, then, is uh, just where this technology is headed. Um, I'm excited about technology. I think the dairy industry is fun to work with because, because dairy farmers tend to be rapid adopters of technology and I think there's a lot of things coming down, down the pike. I think that these accelerometer systems are here to stay. I think they're going to get better as we move forward and I think there's going to be other interesting things that these systems can do. This is uh, the SCR system and so the purple line that you see here is rumination. And so the collars are actually measuring a proxy for rumination, which would simply be having a microphone there on the cow's neck, trying to detect chewing activity, eruptation, those kinds of things. The green line then is this activity. And so what you're looking at is the newer software that they have for these systems, much nicer interface than the one I was showing you before. But you can see in green, here's a cow that shows estrus. And this is the inner estrus period here. She's showing an estrus here. And one of the things that you can note right away with the rumination change is when a cow comes into estrus, she's not spending time lying down and ruminating and eating. She's actually moving around and doing a lot of mounting. So her rumination change decreases. And so here you can see rumination change decreasing at this second estrus period. And I think anytime you look at a biological event like estrus, when you have more than one stream of data, to confirm that that event is actually happening, you actually increase the accuracy of that quite a bit. And I think it's an exciting time to be in the dairy industry, and I think we're seeing a lot of new technologies coming along. The ability, for example, to measure uh, pregnancy-associated glycoproteins or progesterone uh, in milk or in blood uh, in real time, uh, I think we're headed for some really interesting changes in the, in the industry as we, as we move forward. So with that, I'll summarize then. 
Uh, again, I think these accelerometer technologies are here to stay, and uh, these technologies will continue to evolve and improve moving forward. These anovular cows are a problem. Um, until we resolve this problem, we're going to have a real hard time relying on 100% heat detection, the kind of system that we would like to have if we were only using an accelerometer system. Um, from the first study, mean time of AI relative to ovulation was acceptable for some cows based on the accelerometer. However, variability among cows in the interval from onset of activity to ovulation decreased conception rate to AI. And then lastly, a variety of strategies using a combination of AI based on increase in activity and synchronization of ovulation and time to AI can be used to submit cows for first AI. Um, and this is something that I've, I've said for a long time now. Some level of synchronization of ovulation and time to AI will improve reproductive performance in almost all dairies. And the reason for this is simply we've got this subpopulation of cows that are anovular. And as I showed in experiment two, these anovular cows do quite well um, on a synchronized breeding program. And finally, conception rates of time to AI appear to be greater for cows receiving time to AI after pre-sync off-sync compared to cows receiving AI after increased activity. I think one of the reasons for this is that we control timing of insemination much better in these systems and uh, we also control uh, the timing of ovulation in relation to uh, insemination.